everyone. Thank you for joining today. And uh, my name is Shorya. I'm from India. Uh, I was an applicant in the match 2024 cycle. I did my medical school from the Philippines, uh, AMS School of Medicine, and I graduated in 2021. And since 2021, I've been devoted to the USMLEs. I took my step one, step two, and step three before this uh, match cycle and went ahead with the match. And uh, currently I'm in India. I was, I'm working as a uh, house staff in internal medicine, the same uh, principle I'm, I applied uh, in the match for. So it's really nice talking to you and thank you for this opportunity. And I wanna thank Program Insider for having me today. And Dr. Shorya, uh, one thing everybody would like to know from you, since 2021 to 2024, the entire two to three years you have devoted. Okay. So we'd like to hear from you, how's your USMLE journey is gone? What about your step one? What about your step two CK and other stuff? Absolutely. So uh, as I graduated from AMS School of Philippines in uh, AMS School of Medicine in Philippines, I came back to India in 2021 after graduation and I had to take my licensing exam in India in order to be able to practice here in India. So after that, I was uh, only inclined to start, uh, you know, my USMLE process. So that took some time. The exam was in was on June 2021. And uh, after passing that exam, I was able to focus uh you know solely on the usml step one so my step one was on january 2022 so i had about uh, five to six months time for preparation because at that time i was waiting for my medical license here and i did not have any work at that time so i devoted my time to usml step one and uh Back then, we were having scores for our, you know, for the step one. It was not pass fail yet. So I got a 250 on USMLE step one. So that was the beginning of my journey. And uh, after I got my step one result, I thought, yeah, this was the path I wanted to take and I wanted to go ahead with USMLE. And on the other hand, I also wanted to have some clinical experience in India because uh, after graduation, I wanted to work here uh, in my home country uh, to add to my CV, to my resume. So I joined as an internal medicine staff physician in one of the public hospitals here in Kolkata. So I was working in that uh, hospital. Uh, it was a 48 hour week uh, work week. And along that, I started my step two journey and that was in around in june or july so in 23 i think i took in 2022 oh. yeah so in uh, from june uh, or july in 2022 i started my step two uh, so i was working and i was studying simultaneously and uh, I, I took my step two on uh, january 2023 so i had like a long time be between my ja step one and step two but then as i was working full time i did not uh, i was not able to dedicate uh, my time for you know the exam solely uh, so i took a little more time than usual but then i did step two exams along with working and i took i took it finally in uh, january 2023 and on step two i scored a 257 uh, so that time I thought that it would be a really good time to pursue for, you know, my US clinical experience, get those letters of recommendation and uh, all that. So I had started applying in 2022 itself and uh, USC options are, uh, though they are not limited, but there are m many applicants trying to get USC. So it's well advised to, you know, apply before like six months or eight months in order to make sure that you get a location or a hospital that you want. So I applied in 2022 and I was able to get a rotation in 2023. So uh, in March 2023, I started uh, uh, 
uh, my US journey. I went to the United States and I went to Michigan first. There I had my first rotation in internal medicine. It was in Portage Hospital. And I worked there for one month there. And then after that, I went to Dearborn, Michigan, and there I had a three months rotation. It was a 12 week rotation in a cardiology outpatient clinic. Uh, so it was Heart and Vascular Institute. I worked there for another three months. So uh, I, I got like four months of USC under my belt. So I thought uh, maybe I, I would be able to take my step three exam before September, you know, since uh, from September, you have to, you know, before September, you have to apply to the residency, you have to select the programs, make your personal statement, make your CV, ERA CV, work on all of that. So uh, I did all of that in September, but in August, I took my step three examination. And uh, so yeah, I, I got a 246 on my step three as well. Uh, so after that, I came back to India in September and uh, from September, all, all of September, I actually worked on my personal statement and CV and mm -hmm. on my application. So after September, the interview season starts. It lasts from September to February and sometimes even uh, like end of February, you can get inv invites as late as that. So I, I had three interviews this season and uh, I took the interviews in December and January, but unfortunately I did not match. So the reason I, uh, I signed up for this webinar is because uh, you see a lot of applicants who have masked and who have advice to give you, share with you. But uh, I think from my mistakes, those that I've uh, done during my journey, I think it gives you a learning opportunity as to what not to do uh, during this journey and things to do that might improve your CV and might I improve your chances to get into a residency. So that is a, all about my journey. So I have seen like, since you got a really good score and you have been training since the past couple of years, if I'm not wrong. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, so you have also mentioned over your portfolio, right? That you, you love teaching. Yeah, I, I oh, actually have been teaching for the last two years since uh, great. Uh, 2022. Yeah. Great. So, so let, let's have some students, uh, you know, study strategies in front of the students. Uh, AMA mm -hmm. School of Philippine students, probably they are in their second, third year. So this is a great time because they, these guys might be preparing for MLA and uh, they should get those information. So, so like it's, it's up to you. Let's start it. Yeah, absolutely. I think uh... So since uh, 2022, the step one has become pass fail. So uh, right away, I would suggest that, you know, take three or four months, study hard, just do the first aid for step one, 2000, uh, first aid for step one, the latest edition that you have right now and uh, do e-world along with it. And I think by three, uh, three to four months, you can just uh, be done with your step one and if you get a pass, that's it, chapter closed. So the thing is that uh, since step one became pass fail, right now you have to focus more on your step two because uh, step two score has gained more importance after the step one. That, uh, you know, that makes uh, you get an interview because some programs have cut applicants that uh, have scored more than 230s or let's say 240s, something like that. So make sure you ace your step two. So as I said, for step one, three months is enough. Just go through first aid for your uh, step one. That is a very good resource. I would say gold standard resource along with your e-world. And there are some uh, divine intervention podcast or th these are podcasts you can uh, listen to whenever you're you know whenever you're working out at the gym or you're driving to your work or you know before going to bed so it's very easy you just have to listen to it it's it's a passive learning process but i think it helps you retain some of the most important concepts that are being tested on the usmles yeah. 
so apart from that uh, you can also if if you're particularly weak in some subject like some uh, let's say you're weak in cardiovascular system or if you're weak in gastroenterology you can just go through boards and beyond videos and you can uh, take a look at those these are these are very simplified and uh, well explained videos and really helpful for step one and some other resources are you can use sketchy uh, if you're a visual learner so they have uh, microbiology and they have uh, i think yeah they have pharmacology as well so i, I actually watched the microbiology uh microbiology videos later in my preparation but uh, like i did not use it during my step one but i found that it uh, can be useful sometimes if you're a visual learner especially okay. you should you should not dedicate more time on step one and use it uh, on your step two instead because the score on your step two is much more important these days all right so important. for step two, uh, again, the gold standard uh, would be your UWorld. Uh, but uh, step two UWorld has a, I think it's a really huge question bank. It has more than 4,000 question bank, uh, questions uh, only on UWorld. So I think mm -hmm. uh, if you complete that and along with your uh, first state for your assembly step one, uh, you should be golden uh, to take step two. Also, you yeah. can do the CMS forms that comes with it. And obviously the assessments, everybody does those. Those are for step one as well. You can do the NBMEs, you can do uh, the U UWSAs, you can do the free 120s. These are the things uh, that you must do uh, for your exam. But in general, uh, for the preparation, I would say, keep it simple and try to learn the concepts that are being taught on your world. Because from my experience, what I have seen that, uh, what whatever the questions that you are getting on your world whatever the concepts that you're getting on your world those are tested on the actual exam but the scenario might be different the way they are composing the question that might be different otherwise it's still the same so if you get your concepts out you know out in out of the dark you just have a clear lucid uh, you know idea of what's going on in each each and every system i think you'll do well on your step two and uh, apart from that divine intervention podcast also uh, help with your step two there are some uh, some few youtube channels i used to watch uh, those are for rapid revision one question we have from dr nandini uh, from nandini jha so should first year students start using the UWorld since first year? Uh, I would advise against it because uh, so see UWorld uh, is a learning tool that you should only use just before your exam. Okay. Uh, I would recommend from the day one of your medical school along with your medical school curriculum start reading your first aid. Onwards except step one you would like to you know refer to the students basically from the philippine students because these these students has a curriculum of american medical system right so what's your suggestion yeah so actually during my medical school like during my first year we had a uh, I think a lot of international medical textbooks like uh, for anatomy, we had uh, Moore's clinically, uh, clinical anatomy and sometimes we referred to Gray's anatomy and for physiology, we studied uh, Guyton uh, as a whole. I mean, it was really the one of the best books I have studied th throughout my medical school. For biochemistry, uh, I would suggest you can uh, for building your concepts, you can go watch Kaplan videos, uh, Dr. Sam Turco. You can find these videos online. Uh, they are somewhere there. Just find them, look for them, and uh, go through these videos. And uh, so these things, uh, these videos, they give you a really, you know, good idea of what is biochemistry all about because most of the time I have seen that people don't uh, like studying biochemistry, but for me it was initially same for me because i didn't like to study biochemistry at all in my first year but later when i did 
the Kaplan videos for Biochem, I really fell in love with Biochem. So everything makes sense when it's taught in a good way. So you'll understand advice. For microbiology, I think uh, there's a book called uh, uh, Clinically Oriented Microbiology or uh, Microbiology Made Ridiculously Simple. So that, that, uh, that book really helped me during my second year. Uh, also, we used to study first aid again. Yeah, so basically first two years, uh, first aid should be your Bible. Like whatever you're studying in your medical school, just refer back to first aid and see whatever first aid has to teach you. Just learn them by your heart. So by that time, your uh, you have to take your step one you know, you won't have any difficulty at all. Maybe in, even in two months, you'll be able to done with your step one. So that saves some time and gives you time for your step two. So right. I think that's a good strategy if you're in year one or year two. Uh, I think uh, your overall profile is very important when it comes to USMLE. Like uh, your scores will get you an interview maybe or... Uh, I mean, your overall profile needs to be really good if you want to match into a program. So uh, your overall profile, of course, includes your scores. They are, of, of course, there and they definitely help. But apart from that, you have your uh, uh, US clinical experiences, you have your volunteer experiences, you have your research work, uh, all of these things. So these things are equally important. So from what I've learned that, uh, uh, so this year, a lot of younger graduates, like people who have graduated in 2023 or even 2022, uh, they have a better match rate from what I believe it is my personal belief. Uh, mm -hmm. So yeah, they ha I think they have a better match rate. So those who are in their second or first I mean, they, who, those who are in med school right med school. now, I would suggest to, you know, uh, try to complete your USMLE exams and try to apply as soon as possible after you graduate. Mm -hmm. So be, why I say this? Because the longer year of graduation you have, for example, I had a year of graduation of three years, okay, because I graduated in 2021. And then I had a US clinical experience of... Uh, almost four months. So I believe that in order to uh, be a successful match candidate, I think you have better US clinical experiences if your year of graduation is more than two, like it's if it's two or three or even more, I think you should have at least six months of US clinical experiences. That is my opinion. Uh, Another thing is that I have seen some candidates, uh, I personally know a few candidates who have matched on their second attempt. Uh, this year. second thing is research experience. So for research, it's, it's really difficult to, you know, start doing a research. Uh, if you're in medical school, I would suggest, uh, you know, if you have a senior who are doing research or if you know someone, know, uh, know a professor who is doing research or an attending maybe, just uh, try to email them uh, and try to express your interest towards research and say that you're willing to learn, say that you're willing to do whatever it takes to learn research. And after that, uh, you might get a response from them, you might not. So these are called cold emailing. So let's say uh, you take a look at all the programs that you find on ERAS, okay? So there are, let's say, close to 200, 250 IMG-friendly programs you, you can find on ERAS. So just go, go, go to their program and uh, on the website, you can find that what kind of research they are doing. So depending on that, you find a certain faculty in, in, uh, in the principle that you want to apply to. For example, I, I was applying to internal medicine. So I would look, take a look at all the IM faculties and try to email them expressing your interest uh, that you want to do a research, you want to be a part of a project, something like that. So if you, let's say, if you send like 100 or 200 emails, you might get back, uh, you know, you might hear back from one or two. I mean, that those are the odds. I mean, there are no easy way to do this, uh, but you have to do cold emailing and try to 
get a research position like this or you know get a research project like this other than that you can uh, of course you can do uh, case studies you can publish case studies so if you are going to a hospital and if you're working in a hospital setting just try to you know keep your eyes open for any interesting cases that you might come across and then ask your preceptor or ask your attending whether it is possible to uh, publish a case study or not there are some uh, organizations on instagram as well that uh, you know they try to help you but uh, i think it's better if you are able to publish by yourself like uh, learn learn it by yourself from a mentor that's definitely better so that is uh, that's about research and then you have your volunteer experience so for the volunteer experience i think uh, whichever country you're in whether you're in philippines whether you're in any country or even if you're in you're in india there are multiple volunteering opportunities people are always looking for volunteers for some things uh, in india i am part of an organization called doctors for a cause so i've been doing uh, health camps with them and uh, so they they do health camps all over india and uh, the thing is you don't have to be a doctor in order to participate or volunteer as a health camp see as a medical student you can also volunteer you don't need to have a valid license in order to participate you just won't be able to write a prescription that's all but you can volunteer in other other way so just try to look for these opportunities around you like wherever you are and uh, the more volunteer experience you have the more better but uh, I would say just don't compromise on uh, on your exams because of this volunteering. Uh, just make sure you get a good score. Okay. And I'm also part of, as I mentioned uh, earlier, I'm also part of an organization called uh, uh, Aspiring Mentor. So I used to teach there as well. So these can also be count, uh, counted as a volunteering experience. So these are the things you can do. Like if you're into teaching, find some teaching position. If, you're, if you want to volunteer clinically, just find someone who's doing health camps, just attend health camps and all that stuff. And one other thing I would like to emphasize here is that, see, uh, if you volunteer one time with uh, some obscure organization that doesn't show dedication towards the rest is that find some organizations that uh, you feel attracted to, like uh, you share their motives, like you for a longer period of time. See, in the United States, uh, after uh, after the uh, people graduate from med school, they have like uh, long hours of volunteering, like 80 hours, 120 hours of volunteering. You cannot do that in one day so you have to improve your volunteering by doing it uh, in a longer time just make sure you're attached uh, you're attached to one of the organizations and keep working with them uh, that's all for volunteer and i would like to add two more things uh, the first would be your personal statement so when you're applying to residency the personal statement is the first thing uh, the program director or the program coordinator sees and it is your one tool to you know make them like you so you have to really uh, write a really strong uh, personal statement with a hooking statement in the beginning that uh, you know that uh, moves them that makes them want to discover more about you so uh, if you're going to be applying anytime soon, like in 2025 or 2026, whenever, just try to recollect the most important uh, uh, aspects of your life that drove you to medicine, why you like internal medicine, uh, interesting anecdotes and like uh, uh, incidents that happened to you during your medical school that make, made you move towards internal medicine. So yeah, uh, personal statement is another thing. And lastly is your CV. So 
a well curated CV is one of the most important things. So let's say you have a really good score, really uh, good volunteering experience, US clinical experience, all of that. But even after that, if you don't have a well written CV, the programs will not like you, will not send you an invite. So uh, a well written CV is one of the most important things that you should not overlook which I think I did because I last uh, season I wrote my CV by myself. I did not get it double checked by any uh, professional, uh, you know, professional organizations. I just uh, got it checked with my, by my friends. So I think that could have been another reason my CV was not perfect. So make sure you review your CV, make sure you review your personal statement because these are the some of the info, uh, important things that the program director would take a look at before they give you okay. an interview. Great, great, great thought, doctor. You have covered each and everything in the overall profile. Uh, just one thing which I would like to add here is um, taking a mentorship is really important is in this entire journey because this journey is not just end up with the scores, or end up with a CV, or end up with research, or end up with publication, or something else. So take an overall look, understand, and one who could you know drive your journey to the day of starting your USMLE step one to the day end of getting succeeded into the United States medical licensing journey. So I think that should also uh, also be a part of your entire life. It might be the person who is there in the United States. It might be the person who had done this journey. It might be the person from your college. So anyone it would be well versed in this entire process, like the Dr. Shorya is. All right. So that's what the reason that Dr. Shorya is right now here standing in front of you and, you know, guiding you all. Patients, as I said, uh, 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 a while ago it's one of the most important things that decides whether you are going to get residency or not uh, so see the problem is every passing year the number of international medical graduates are increasing a uh, lot of people are applying for the match every year so there's a deficiency of uh, u.s clinical rotations because most of the hospitals they cannot accommodate uh, this large amount of medical students or even medical graduates, right? So what you have to do first thing is like apply early. If you want to be applying, uh, let's say if you want to apply for match 2026, I would suggest you to start right now for next year in order to secure a good rotation. And my personal experience, I did uh, one uh, inpatient rotation in uh, Portage Hospital, that's in Michigan. It was an inpatient rotation ship, uh, inpatient externship. It was quite hands-on. I was able to talk to the patients, do physical examinations. I was able to uh, take a look at the electronic medical records, the EMRs that is there in the US. I was able to do the notes and all that stuff. Uh, of course, under a preceptor. And for my second rotation, I already mentioned this. It was at a Heart and Vascular Institute. It was also a cardiology uh, outpatient clinic. Uh, however, it was a clinic. It was a really busy clinic, and we had a really good learning experience over there because the doctors were willing to teach you, and uh, they uh, we had a lot of you know bread and butter cardiology cases. And we had a lot of patients coming in. Uh, so let's say every day we would have 80 to 90 patients showing up and that would that got divided that gets divided uh, to the externs. So it's definitely a learning experience. And if you start looking at ECGs like uh, 15, 20 ECGs every day, you can you know slowly uh, master basic ECGs easily. And then these doctors, they will take you to the hospitals. There, there are a few of hospitals like uh, St. John's Ascension Hospital, that's in Detroit. And there's Providence Hospital that's in Southfield. These doctors would uh, take, take you with them and uh, they will let you observe procedures such as uh, uh, cardiac catheterization. They will uh, show you how to do aortic valve replacements and uh, uh, stenting of the carotid arteries. So these are the fun things you can do if you perform well in the rotation. 
and uh, but the only problem with this rotation was that it does not give you any inpatient experience however i believe a combination of inpatient and outpatient is the best way to go like it's if you only have inpatient experience and not outpatient i don't think that really works in your favor you should have a good well balanced us clinical experience right so all of those who are in medical school right now i would suggest uh, to do elect so if you graduate you can either do uh, observerships that's the bulk of us clinical experience or you can do externships externships are really hard to come across uh, there are only a few externships that i know of and most of them are very competitive to get into uh, because uh, the because of the sheer number of imgs applying okay and as a student i think you have much more uh, freedom you can do electives in multiple university hospitals uh, so they, they offer electives to students only and of course you have to keep an eye out you have to know from beforehand when to apply when when is the mm -hmm. deadline approaching mm -hmm. uh, i'll i'll give you an, one example so uh, there's a, of course everybody knows about cleveland clinic right so mm -hmm. cleveland clinic what they do is they uh, open their uh, registration from january to march for uh, for the uh, you know period of june to december so if you want to apply from uh, if you want to get a rotation from june to december 2024 you have to apply in january to march right and the sheer volume again uh, that applies for the cleveland clinic rotation is i mean it's really great I mean, a lot of IMGs are applying, so the chances are really slim that you're going to get a rotation over there. Uh, okay. But uh, see, you have to try it anyway. Uh, purpose of doing the rotations is there are actually two purposes. The first one is your letter of recommendation. The second one would be your making connections. So uh, on ERAS, for a single program, you can apply up to like four letter of recommendations, right? And most of the programs, they are okay with three. Uh, so if you have three letter of recommendation from the United States, that's fine. You can just add one home country letter of recommendation and you'll be good to go. However, if you have more US clinical experiences, uh, I mean, uh, it's okay. You're not doing it for the letter of recommendation then, you're doing it for the connection. So the people you work with during the rotation, the residents that you work with, the preceptors, uh, you know, they later in life might give uh, give you an opportunity to do research with them. They might give you an opportunity to, you know, interview at some program because uh, they can, you know, they know that you are a really good candidate uh, from your time at the rotation. They know that you're really hardworking, you're diligent and you're showing up at work before time and you're staying uh, uh, late every day for work so you know these things show how hard working you are and if your preceptor notices this uh, he might uh, you know give your recommendation to the program he is attached to and you might get an interview from this program so connections are very important these days because uh, again, the number of IMGs are increasing, so the program director has to go through, let's say, 2,000, 3,000 applications just to select 200 or maybe 150. But then if if an attending is coming and saying, just take a look at this candidate, he's really hardworking, he had uh, mm -hmm. done really a superb job during the rotation, I think that uh, gives you more credibility and gives you an edge over all the other candidates, right? One to understand, uh, is it really important to, to do a research or get published in America? That is one thing. Or we can do it from anywhere. That is the first question. So uh, I would like to hear from you. Okay, so the first thing is that if you get a research published from USA, I think it's the best thing that you can do. But since most of us are not uh, getting the you know opportunity to publish uh, from high high impact journals, I think we have to make do with whatever we have. Uh, mm -hmm. Even home country case reports, even home country publications are uh, I think really okay. 
So now there are few things to keep in mind. Let's say you're doing a, a observational study or let's say a cross-sectional study in the United States uh, and you publish that compared to in your home country you're participating in a clinical trial or or a cohort study that goes on for about like six months or so and you participate in that study and get it published so i think in this scenario the cohort study would be a much better option than publishing a cross-sectional study in the united states so okay. the level of the study that you're publishing that comes into play so the higher the level of the study that you're publishing, the better. And if you're able to do it in the US, even more better. But if you're not able to do it in the US and if you want to do it in your home country, you feel free to, you know, uh, do it. Like you must uh, do it because I think at least some experience in the research is really necessary because, uh, uh, USMLE is becoming competitive with every passing year. So most of the candidates are doing some form of research and they're, uh, you know, they have a really diverse profile. So make sure your profile is uh, very diverse as well. Make sure you have experiences in all, all the, you know, all, all the specific areas, right? Okay.